All right, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, it's the Volleyball BC Coach Webinar Series. This is our first one tonight. Uh, we'll be having a total of five this week, um, every evening from at 7 p.m. Today's presentation on team culture is gonna be presented by Shane Hyde from the VIU Mariners Women's Volleyball Program. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jay Tremonti and I'm the technical director with Volleyball BC and we'll be moderating tonight's presentation. Uh, before we get going and uh, with Shane, just uh, a few housekeeping items. So for tonight's format, the presentation will be approximately 30 to 45 minutes followed by Q&A which will be roughly an hour in total. We have attendees viewing on both Zoom and YouTube Live. So there's a hundred person limit with our Zoom webinar account. And so for those who were unable to register through Zoom can watch on the YouTube channel. And we'll be also archiving the footage from the webinar on, on our channel there as well. So if you know anyone who's struggling with uh, Zoom registration, or uh, anyone who can't make it tonight, uh, just tell them to go to our YouTube channel and you can check out the presentations there. For Q&A tonight, uh, we're, we're gonna ask that participants of the webinar use the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, platform. Uh, I'll be taking a look at that box and asking questions when we can during the presentation. And once the presentation's finished, we'll do a much more thorough uh, Q&A period. So please uh, comment in the Q&A box or on YouTube Live, there is a, a comment function that you can use that I'll be checking as well. So without further ado, uh, Shane, can you uh, can we get you live on the webinar? Hey, Jay. Hey, guys. Shane, thanks. Thanks for coming on tonight. Um, so you're lucky number one, you're our first presenter here. And as mentioned, Shane's been with the, the VIU program for, for a number of years now. Uh, I believe he's entering his 20th season as head coach. Is that right, Shane? That's correct. Yep. And yeah, so we're, we're really excited to, to learn a little bit more about how you deliberately create culture with your program and, and how you go about uh, checking in on it during the season and influencing it throughout. So um Again, without further ado, Shane, you can take it away here. Awesome, thanks, Jay. Well, let me just uh, let me just get this up and running first. Apologize, everyone, for my lack of uh, technical skills. Is that good? Are you uh, are you seeing that on your screen? No, not yet, Shane. Okay, hold on one sec. Give me one second. Here we go. Looks good. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. So thanks again, Jay. And uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know we'd have the uh, the numbers that Jay's saying we've got. So that's that's awesome. Um, so today, Jay asked me to to talk about uh, creating successful team culture, and uh, it's something that I I really truly uh, believe a lot in. Um, I, it's uh, it's something that I think is a is a lost kind of uh, a skill with uh, with the new generation of coaching, and I and I love to hear that. We're kind of bringing it back. So um, without further ado, let's get started. So who I am? Yeah, okay, Jay already uh, introduced me a little bit. Um, my name's Shane Hyde. I am going into my 20th year as head coach of the Vancouver Island University Mariners. I started off my coaching career as a juvenile girls coach right out of high school. Um, I coached for a small little community in Parksville, Parksville Volleyball Club. This was before clubs did any kind of... Uh, recruiting or uh they don't do that i'm sure um but uh at the same time i was also coaching senior boys um so i was coaching a senior boys program at, at the local high school um and i did those did those kind of simultaneously for about seven years 
Uh, I went, also went on to be the vice president of the club, um, again, for about five to seven years. Um, and, uh, and then I came back. I came back. I, this is a joke here. I, obviously, after an incredible indoor playing career, I played one year with the, the VIU Mariners. It actually was called the Malaspina Mariners at the time. And uh, I came back as a mature student at 24. Uh, and I and then I realized, hey, this playing thing is not for me. I was a beach player, and, uh, and the indoor game had long passed me. So I joined the Mariner program as an assistant coach for two years. The reason why I'm kind of sharing you sharing my my background with you guys is that I do believe that it's important to understand all the levels of volleyball, and that's something that I actually appreciate a lot with my coaching career. Lots of times I will will go to a, a Bowden Cup. Um, tryouts or uh, any kind of um, Team BC uh, work with kids or some camps and and a lot of times the feedback from some of the higher level coaches are oh I can't uh, I can't relate to that level uh, I really do believe that it's important to be able to relate to that level whether you're coaching U14 or or you're coaching all the way up at the university level I think that uh, there's so much that you can offer and so much that you can um, change your uh, your, your coaching and definitely what I'm talking about today in, in creating team culture. It's just, there's different uh, challenges with, with every level that you're coaching at. So team culture, why is it, uh, why is it important and why is it so important for me? So first of all, first off, uh, creating team culture, I believe is like designing the blueprints to your dream home. I don't know how you can build a successful team without successful team culture. And so you really need to um, design your blueprints. You have to have a plan. And uh, <clears throat> as coaches, again, at every level, especially at the younger levels, it's important to understand that, that we do more than just uh, you know, teach, the, teach our athletes how to serve, how to set, how to dig, how to block. Uh, in fact, we're usually way more than that. We're, um, we're their su support staff, we're their guidance counselors, we're their educational advisors, we shape their careers, we're their mentors, uh, psychologists, and then at times we're just their friends. And um, without creating that successful team culture, I believe we're, we're not able to, to be all this to our athletes. So very, very important at every level. Our athletes need a safe environment to learn and flourish on and off the court. Quality team culture allows them to feel comfortable to fall down and make mistakes. Sometimes, um, whether you're on the court, field, in an arena, wherever, wherever you coach, the only place that these kids feel safe is, uh, is, is in those areas. And I believe that creating this team culture, uh, creating a safe environment is key for us so that they come back and enjoy their time with us. So before I go any further, I got to brag a little bit about our program and I'll explain why in a second. So, so yes, I coach at Vancouver Island University. Now, um, our program has become one of the most successful dynasties in the Canadian College Athletic Association, the CCAA. Uh, in the past 19 years, um, we have never failed to medal at our provincial championships. We've won 12 gold, five silver, two bronze. In 19 years, we have only failed to qualify for our national championships twice. So 17 years, we've made our national championships. In those 17 years, we've medaled 14 times. We've won six gold, four silver, and four bronze. Um, out of those 17 trips to nationals, we've been in, in the national final 10 times. And uh, we've been the national championships for the last five years. We're currently three time defending national champs. A lot of cool stuff, no doubt, big deal. As successful as we have become, those accolades, um, they mean nothing. It's only success on the court. Now, don't get me wrong, I love winning, um, but success is only one outcome from having a success, successful team culture. One of the greatest results of creating quality team culture is the connection that you get with your alumni to your program. The ability to have players wanting to come back and share some of their greatest memories with the next generations of younger Mariners, Ducks, Thunderbirds, Blues, whatever club you're with. That's the key. That's the most important part of having this success, successful team culture. 
The building blocks to a successful team culture, I believe that there's two things that need to be present on any team to have successful culture. It's there, there just has to be two, these two things. And if they're not there, you, you have no chance. The first thing is cohesion. You have to have to team cohesion. And the second thing is you have to build respect. If you do not have respect, you're in trouble. So cohesion. Um, if you're, uh, if you're looking up to cohesion in the, in the dictionary, um, you're going to, you're going to see, uh, the definition, the act or state of cohering, uh, uniting or sticking together tightly. That's, that's what cohesion means. That's what our goal is in order to create team culture. We need that cohesion. We need our athletes unifying and sticking together. When other teams are playing, uh, playing exhibition matches and breaking down their technical play, we're working on our team cohesion. We truly are building that in our, in our uh, beginning, um, beginning phases of our season. When I said that team culture was the blueprints, well, I believe cohesion is the foundation. There is no positive team culture created without a strong cohesive group. We've all heard or seen those teams or, or uh, groups that have drama, gossip, cliques. Um, they're all signs of a team that has not created cohesion on their, on their team. This team will implode and obviously will not have success, have successful team culture. It's important when developing your yearly plan to allow time and practice towards creating team cohesion. During your season, continue to build on this and review it. Some big mistakes I believe that coaches make uh, that they do a team retreat and then they think that they're done. It's like, okay, I've, I've done my team retreat. That was great. Looks like the team likes each other and bang off to the, you know, off to the X's and O's and they forget. This happened to me in my first year, first year coaching. Um, I was a very successful uh, club coach, very successful high school coach. And then I took the reins as head coach of the Mariners undefeated at Christmas time. And, uh, and then all of a sudden things just started going sideways and I, I just never understood what was happening. I, I thought everything was in check and, um, and I'd coach guys. So not to be sexist here, but in the guy's world, it was like, you have an issue and bang, they deal with it immediately. They call each other out. It's dealt with. It's good. This was my first experience coaching on the girls side. And it wasn't until Christmas time until I knew that we had major, major issues happening all over springing up. Sally hated Jane. Jane uh, liked Jill's boyfriend. And it, there was so much stuff going on that we didn't nip in the bud at the beginning of the season. And after that season, I learned a lot from it. We had a very successful season that year, but it was literally band-aids throughout the whole year. So create that team cohesion as much as possible at the beginning and throughout the year. The second part of, uh, of a team culture that needs to be there, like I said, is respect. So respect and cohesion go hand in hand. It's kind of that chicken or the egg question. What's, what comes first? I believe it's cohesion, but respect could easily be there too. Um, if team culture, like I said, is the blueprints, cohesion was the foundation, then I believe respect is the, is the product that creates that foundation, the cement, the rebar, the material. That is what um, respect is. So cohesion, respect, very, very key. I believe there are four levels of respect um, that are needed and they're all equally important to a team's culture. The four levels of respect are respect for your teammates, respect for yourself, respect for the program, and respect for the process. Respect for the team. So um, our team consists of about 12 to eight athletes. I think at the club level, you guys are Hopefully you're not that high because there'd be a lot of struggles with playing time, but, but usually our teams are, are roughly around 12 to 18 athletes. And then we're dealing with one to four coaches. Um, there are no two team team members created equal. Um, everyone shares different upbringings, beliefs, cultures, religions, and many more differences. Uh, there's no way that we can expect all these athletes to be friends. I don't care how great of a coach you are, how great of a, psychologist you are, you are never going to make all of these teammates be best friends. However, we can make it mandatory that each and every player and coach is respected. 
Coaches and bench personnel are often left out, left out when referring to teammates. Uh, lots of times when you think of a team, it's like, oh yeah, the teammates and the coaches. Well, what we preach is that teammates are everyone. The coaches, the bench personnel, and the players. You are all teammates. Uh, success and failures are felt by everyone. There's no backstabbing, no gossip. Every player is included in activities. Confrontations and disagreements are dealt with quickly, but done between individuals, one-on-one, -on -one, not in front of the whole team. There's always room to question each other. I would strongly encourage it, but it's done in a calm, appropriate manner. In fact, one of the things that we have on our team, one of the things we, uh, we preach is we ask the question, why? So at the very beginning of the year, I asked the players that, during the season, I'm going to ask them to answer why. And if they can't answer why, then they're, they're out of line, they're out of position, they're out of whatever, whatever, the, whatever the answer would be, uh, or whatever the question, um, the actions regarding that question would be. And I ask them to, to, to ask me the same question. So if a player comes into my, my office and says, hey, how come we're doing um, combination plays? How come we're doing combination plays? uh advanced hitting and we can't serve receive what's the point well i probably will make something up i'll probably be um uh pull something out and and have some kind of an answer but really after that player leaves my office i'll probably be like uh yeah why are we doing service why aren't we doing serve receive in the next practice we're doing serve receive so these are things that we have to be able to question each other but it's done in the right in the right manner. And I think the more times you question each other and you do it in the appropriate manner, I think it builds that cohesion stronger and stronger. You trust each other. The second thing is trust your, or respect yourself. Some athletes are crying out for attention in whatever way they can, they can find it. It is important as coaches to remind these athletes to respect themselves as much as they would their teammates. If an athlete can't respect themselves, it just leads to this disruption of the team cohesion which in turn leads to major disruption on the team's culture. Athletes disrespect themselves in many ways, how they dress, how they behave, how they treat themselves after mistakes or losses in the classroom or in the outside world. It is important to be a good teammate to yourself before you can be a good teammate to others. So two examples of this, lots of times I'll ask an athlete, I'll be like, how come you're, you're like getting all over yourself after you just missed that ser serve receive after that pass? You shank the pass and now you're like swearing at yourself inside and you would never treat a teammate that way. Why are you doing that to yourself? So respect yourself. The other thing is when you're taking a, when you're on a plane, the flight attendants will always say to you, uh, you know, if the oxygen masks come down, uh, put it on yourself and then put it on your, on your child. Um, Cause you're no good to your child. If you, if you're not getting the oxygen, it's the same thing here. If you're not respecting yourself, you're not helping your team uh, create the culture that they want. And there's so many times that one mishap, one night out on the town, and you can disrupt an entire season's worth of work um, because you didn't respect yourself. And this is something that at our level, we talk about a ton. We do a lot of work with respecting yourself. Respect the program. Every time you put on a jersey, you represent something much larger, whether like, like I said, maybe you're wearing a Ducks jersey or a UBC jersey or a wherever you're from. Um, but those jerseys, they don't come off. So you may walk out into the community and you think that those jerseys are off. Well, they are, you're still representing a program somewhere. So respect the program. Um, Mistakes off the court can lead to disruptions for the entire team's culture, whether it's in suspensions, whether it's in just unclassy moves that, uh, that, that just get you into trouble. It's not, it's not a good sign. We spend a great deal of time breaking down what our program would look like to opposing teams, officials, the fans, alumni. And we always talk about never disrespecting the program. Being classy is an important statement we use year to year at our program at BIU. It's very hard to be liked when you're on top. I can guarantee there's a lot of people that do not like the VIU Mariner women's volleyball team, but our teams should always be respected. 
So most of the times, if, if our opponents actually, maybe some of them are watching, but if they look out there and they actually really think about it, it's like, yeah, I've never once seen a Mariner uh, block a girl and scream and yell at them in their face and, and, and never belittle anybody. We turn around. There's times where I lose my cool. There's no doubt about that. And I struggle with that. And I'm trying to. My assistant coach keeps me in check as much as he can. But definitely uh, respecting the program is something. And mainly off the court is something that we really, really have to stress that that uniform does not come off. We live in Nanaimo. We're on one of the main, only programs for women's volleyball uh, well next to Camosun. Um, and we, we get... Uh, we get recognized all over the community. So if we mess up in the community, that directly affects our program. So respecting our program is key for our team culture. And just a, just a quick question here. Yep. Um, how would you go about dealing with the situation or conflict arises with, with respect in the program if, uh, you know, if, if something negative happens? Um, and I don't know if you can take us through an example without, you know, too many details, but how, if you, if you're seeing something going on with your program, that isn't what you think is, is what your program's about. How do you deal with that? That's a great question. And, uh, it, you know, first of all, you need to evaluate the level of, uh, of a mess up, we'll call it. Um, one example that I have is, is, uh, I think it happened way more back in the days of hazing and all that kind of stuff. There is absolutely none of that happening on our team. Um, but I think what we try to do is we try to prevent it from the start. We talk about it a lot at the beginning so that it doesn't occur. So we almost scare our new athletes into, you know, not messing up. But there was a time when we had a, had a coach, sorry, we had a captain that I had kind of told her to, to play on the, the soccer team as well, dual athlete. So she was the captain of the soccer team, captain of our, of our team. Soccer team, uh, soccer season starts before ours. And, uh, and she was, uh, their team had a different type of culture. And their culture was hazing. Their culture was to get their rookies drunk. Um, and what they would do is they would tape uh, beer mugs to their hands. And so there was a lot of stuff they did, but this was one of their, one of their exercises. And, and so anyways, Monday, Monday uh, newspaper hits front page, front page, not even front page on the sports news is this picture of a VIU, VIU um, a Jersey or a shirt with a girl with a taped beer mug and this whole article about hazing. Well, this was my captain who was also captain of the soccer team. We had a long discussion of it. She, she knew she was wrong, um, but, uh, but that was their culture for their soccer team. And I said, well, listen, if you, if you want to be involved in our team, even though you're soccer right now, you're still part of our team. I gave her an option. Like none of that stuff would ever, would ever slide. And, and she's women's volleyball before she's women's soccer in terms of that type of culture. But we've had times where we've, we've tried to have players that have, have, you know, uh, that have messed up and, depending on the severity, we, we've released them in, immediately. We have probably three or four athletes on our team that had messed up so badly that, that they just, they were no longer welcome on our team. So, and then other ones, we just, you know, try to walk them through the process and explain to them that the, the situations were incorrect. Awesome. A, lot of time, a lot of times we'll leave it to our veterans. And then the veterans, if it's too, too severe, then it comes down to me. And then, then I will uh, institute some kind of a, of a punishment. I hate using that word, but that's usually what happens. Great. Thanks, yep. Shane. Our last, uh, our last respect is respecting the process. So there are a few things that we always stress on our team, and I'm sure that you guys use them in your teams or, or you can adopt your own things, but we talk about enjoying the process. What's the point of, uh, of competing if you can't enjoy the, the entire process of the journey of uh, from the startup of the season to the, to the championship. So enjoy that process. Um, gold is in the details. We talk so much about the small little things all adding up to one big thing. Um, one of the things is like our, again, Jay, your comment to how do we police this stuff or how do we, um, if somebody does mess up, how, how does this happen? Something as simple as this gold is in the details could be, 
you forgot your team socks. You forgot your your um, your shoes for that match. It's back at the hotel. Usually something minor like that, which actually could be major, um, the the vets will deal with it. The, and if it's a one time thing, it's like, oh man, don't worry about, it, just don't do it again. If it starts happening all the time, well then um, then we got some issues. So we talk a lot about goals and the details, making sure our backpacks are lined up, our shoes are lined up everything is dealt with so that once the game starts we are good to go there's method to the madness this is something that um, um try not to know too much again I, I i i apologize for my sexist comments here but on the women's side of the game they need to know everything they need to know where, where they're going to be what time where they're going on the men's side it's like hey where, where do i play i'll just get out there and play it's so different coaching the two different um, two different groups, and and I'm obviously generalizing here, but there's method to the madness. Chill out, relax, it'll happen. So we talk about that a lot. Celebrate what's right with the world. So much we can we're living this right now, where we can seriously just get sour about the situation. Uh, but what we try to do is we try to celebrate what's right with the world. Um, you know, a situation like this. I've even used these remarks before uh, talking with friends uh, about this COVID stuff where it's like, well, I get to hang out with my, my family and uh, get, get slow time, which I'm not usually like, might be BSing a little bit because I'm ready to go back, but, um, but definitely I'm trying to find what's right with the world. And we do a whole exercise of this. There's, there's actually a celebrate what's right with the world um, National Geographic uh, exercise. And we, we go through this exercise. We've been doing it for about 10 years with, uh, with our team at our retreat. And the last thing is just being patient. There's so much, if, if, if we're getting fired up because we are losing a match in uh, September in preseason, or even in the first, uh, first half of our season, and, and we're panicking because things aren't going right then, we're not designed to be great at the beginning. We're designed to be great at the end. And again, that's on the court. That's also off the court in terms of how we're connecting as a group in terms of the, the culture. So how to build team culture into your seasonal plan. So it's one thing to talk about, okay, cohesion and, uh, and respect. Those are things that need to be part of. Well, how do you do that? So in our program, we've targeted four phases um, to design or maintain our program's culture. The first is the prep phase. Second is the preseason phase. Third is the competition phase. And fourth is the postseason phase. During these four, four um, phases, I believe you need to create three elements. So you need three elements into each one of these phases. Um, the, first, uh, the first element that I like to introduce is a competitive drive. Second is a common struggle. And third, this is new to me and I'll talk about that, is fun. So a competitive drive. So again, we have those four phases. In those four phases, every single phase, I would like to look at this element of competitive drive and include it into every one of those phases. So in the competitive drive, I personally am a strong advocate against participation awards. I'm sure Jay, you might get a whole bunch of uh, comments here in a second, but I believe in, in, uh, in order to create successful team culture, a strong competitive drive needs to be present. There's a time and a place for, particip for participation awards, but in our sports at our levels that we're coaching at, um, no one is going to give awards for al almost making the provincials almost making Team BC, almost being part of Bodden Cup. Oh, here you go. Here's a, here's a medal for getting pretty close to winning a championship. It's not going to happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I have a, an 11 year old and a seven, seven year old and both my son and daughter, they cherish those, those trophies they get for the best cheerer, the best passer, the most improved. They love those trophies. And there is a time and a place for those participation um, uh, awards. But I really truly believe that once you start getting into U14 and above, I really think that we need to start adding some competition and some competitive drive in almost everything that we're doing and all of the phases. Because not only is it gonna help you on the court, it's gonna help mesh that team together. 
let's set these athletes up to succeed when the pressure cooker of competition is there. So it's going to come that, that championship, that qualifying match, that uh, regional um, championship is going to be there. So if you pretend it's not going to be there and then it hits, well, now all those kids and, and you're not successful, all those athletes are going to be upset with each other. They're going to be upset with their performance. It's just going to be a total disaster. So why not keep that competitive drive through every phase that you're going through? The greater success the team has, the greater team culture becomes. It's pretty tough to have great team culture if you're bottom of the barrel and you're losing every game. So I know winning isn't everything, but success is definitely part of uh, the culture. If your team is competitive, is a, is a competitive one, then the level of commitment and passion brings the players together. An example of this is we've all been at those camps and, you know, you, kids aren't even talking to them talking uh in the drills for probably till wednesday and the camp's a five day let's say it's a five day camp and monday tuesday they haven't said a word wednesday they start maybe saying something and then all of a sudden you throw it a serving competition and you put some gatorades around some hula hoops and all of a sudden they're cheering their faces off because now it's a competitive drive maybe you stick four of them together and i know a lot of coaches hate queen of the court because they think it's filler but it's not necessarily filler all the time because you are still creating some team culture. So you go queen of the court, you put four kids together. You've never seen those kids talk before, but now all of a sudden they're, they're succeeding together. They're winning some points together and they're gelling as a team. So in every single phase, create a competitive drive. The other thing that we do at VIU is we create a common struggle. Whenever a team overcomes a situation, um, um, that causes them to have to work together to overcome a common challenge, that team automatically becomes closer. It's, it's a given. Try to develop some situations that make the team struggle so that they are forced to come together using hardships to strengthen the team bond. Example uh, would be a team workout. Like obviously our team has a strength and conditioning coach. Um, we, and we have little mini pods that they work out throughout the week. But we have a, a Monday workout session that's the entire team together. Now, sure, working out, getting stronger, staying, uh, staying fit, prevention of um, injuries, all of that is important with this workout. But the main thing is so that these guys will work out together. They'll be pushed together. They'll be in an uncomfortable situation that brings that team together. Maybe you build something. One year we built a trail for one of the former coaches and he had like five acre property. He was building a trail. I said, no, 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 I'll bring my team over. And so the team built this beautiful trail around his house and we were paid in hot dogs and hot chocolate or something like that. But that was taking the girls out of their environment and building something um, that they weren't used to doing. Doing something for the community, maybe a hike, maybe anything that takes them out of their comfort level and pushes them over to overcome a challenge. Sometimes some of our greatest struggles in, in your season develop into a major building block for you to use as a common struggle for the team. So what I mean by that is something that you weren't planning happens. Instead of being sour about it, what you do is you reflect on it and you use it as that rallying point for your team. And I'll talk about that in a sec. The third thing uh, when building these phases is fun. Um, now, as I said earlier, uh, this is the newest skill that I have included in my coaching arsenal that I can't believe how powerful it is. And I can't believe I'm using it. If you would ask the players that played for me, uh, you know, 15 years ago, they're like, really Shane's being fun. Um, but I definitely think the last five, six years has really changed our, um, our culture on this team by adding this fun factor into it. Um, if you can take away the pressure and let the athletes have fun, it is, it is really scary how great and creative they can be. I think a lot of times as coaches, we overcoach them. We, we tighten them up for the big game. And, uh, and I think what we're trying to do now in all of these phases is to create this fun factor. The bigger the match, the crazier our team will get. And again, I'll explain that in a few minutes. Um, two types of fun, I believe. There's a natural fun where the fun just happens spontaneous, spontaneously, and then it's calculated. 
where we as the coaches uh, create um, drills and the outcome is to have fun. They may not know that that's what the outcome is, but really, truly, that's what we're trying to, uh, to develop there. Um, the more fun a player has, the more emotionally and physically they connect with the overall culture of that team. If you're not having fun, if you're that kid sitting in the back of the bus and not even um, uh, taking part in the singing or the jokes or whatever the fun is, um, you're not really shaping the culture of your team. And, uh, and I think that for me, I noticed this. I noticed these players. I'll call them into the office. I'll say, hey, I noticed you weren't really engaged with the, the team. Let's get going. And, uh, and this is something that I really, really, truly um, think needs to work, uh, be molded into that team. Um, one of the things that, that I hate and I'll, you'll never, ever see uh, happen on my, um, on my teams, you will never see ever one of my athletes having headphones in before a warm-up or before a, 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 a game of any sort in the team rooms, anything. Once you, once you join that team, boom, those headphones are off and you're having fun with your teammates. Shane, just a, a question here. You know, you bring up competition and the competitive drive, and, and then you bring up fun. And I feel that maybe those two things could be at, at odds with one another at certain times. How, how do you balance that, um, those, those two pieces, uh, and particularly in the training environment, uh, balancing fun with, with competition? Okay, that is a great question, Jay. I'm going to get to that. That's going to be a major part of where I'm going with this. Um, so I don't want to reveal that yet, but 100%. And like I said, 15 years ago, I would have been like, absolutely not. We're not having fun. You know what? You just asked the question, so I'm going to say this. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up now. So this year, we are in our semifinal match to go to the go to nationals. We lose that match, we're done. We're feeling the pressure of a three-time or trying to three-peat. So, so that semifinal match is the most important game that we've played all season long. So we have this thing that we carry around everywhere. We call it a block rocker. A lot of the teams have it now. You got the, the um, uh, strobe lights going, the music blare, and that's what we do for our team, for our pre-game -pre stuff. Well, we also, we also do a lot about routine. We, our, our whole day is uh, kind of... Um, chiseled out in this routine. Well, I come in for our pregame talk and we're at Douglas College. I open up the door, ready for our, our team talk. And here is this uh, blanket over this thing with a cross on it and with flowers and everyone's left a little piece of something over top of this thing. And it's the block rocker. Well, they had knocked over the block rocker. So they actually had a funeral for the block rocker before this was their preparation going out to their semifinal game. So, man, if that was me 15 years ago as a coach, I would lose it. But instead, I was just like shaking my head going, that's what our team does. And I don't want to question it. That's what we do. And that's what uh, national final two years ago in Niagara Falls, I walked into the team room and there is a, there is a turkey. They've bought in a turkey with sunglasses on it. And... I don't even ask questions anymore, but that's what our team does. So it is crazy because we're, we're training at such a high level. We're pushing them with that competitiveness, but bang, we hit them with some fun during that time. So again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that stuff, but I, I thought I could throw it out there, but, but definitely um, Jay, I, I really have struggled with this and, and I've, I've fallen to the other side. So that's where we're at. All right. Where are we? Um, did I answer that okay for you, Jay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Let's keep going. All right. I don't know where we are for time. I got to race through this here because I got lots to go. All right. Prep phase. Okay. Uh, this phase occurs um, during the recruiting process. So these are our four phases. So uh, this phase happens before the athletes actually get to our, to our team. One of the most important skills in creating successful team culture is picking the right person who will fit your team. We have that privilege to do that. So as college coaches, university coaches, we can actually recruit the right people. Before I commit to an athlete, I do my due diligence, talk to other coaches, talk to former players, and I find out the background of this, this potential player. Um, and then it basically filters down to decision time. Okay, I need to, I need to weigh the risk versus reward. Will this athlete 
disrupt this great culture I have over on this side or will she improve it? Um, and lots of times I'll look at that athlete. This athlete could be the best player in the country, but man, she comes with a lot of baggage. Do I want to disrupt it? I'll look at my team and I'll say, okay, well, we are a young team. We don't have a lot of real good culture yet. We're, we're kind of a little frail in that area. If I bring this player in, man, that now my culture is, is toast. So I might not take that player. If I've got great leadership, good, good core culture, this, this player over to the left that I know has some issues, I'm thinking if she comes over, we can mold her into what we already have and she can be great for us. So that's your risk versus reward. And, and I think it's really, really important to, to do your background checks on your athletes. Again, some of you guys that are coaching high school, uh, U14, you're kind of just stuck with what you got. You got to build with what you've been given. But definitely at our level, we, we can choose. Um, once we decide that we want the player and they commit, we start shaping the team culture immediately. We have our veterans and captains connect with the, uh, with the incoming players. Uh, we have a group chat where we, we talk about, we give them workout schedules. We talk about course selections. We talk about instructors to stay away from. All that kind of stuff um, is taken care of before that athlete even joins into our program. This really is the only phase that we don't challenge them. We don't uh, give them those, those other elements of the uh, competitive element uh, or so uh, competitive drive and the, uh, the fun and the, uh, uh, um, I should know it, the common struggle. So this one here, we do it, but it's not really in your face and it's not right out there. Preseason phase, in my opinion, is the most important phase. So this is the phase athletes have joined the program. They're just getting to your, to your program. And now we start hitting them with this, uh, this team culture, this idea of, of building it. This is the part of the season where we start introducing things like team visioning. Uh, we create our team identity. Um, we, uh, we really start creating the, the, uh, the blueprints to our season. Week one, we get comfortable. Uh, we get, let the athletes get comfortable. We let them get to know each other. We have some fun examples we do a meet and greet barbecue day one the very first thing they, they come and they uh um i cook them a big feast and they get to know each other they get to know the other coaches the strength and conditioning coaches everybody is present we do a camp with our youth so they're the coaches and then later on in that week we have a fun beach volleyball tournament week two we do a retreat this retreat is legendary. You talk to any VIU athlete that, is, that has been with us for the last 15 years. We do a, this retreat on a remote. Uh, we're about an hour and a half away from any kind of civilization. It's a big chalet, gorgeous, beautiful lake, five acre lake. We do a hike. We, we do these grocery shops that are all um, uh, strategic. Uh, we do a cheesecake making, a cheesecake making exercise where they each are given different types of attitudes and no one knows what kind of personality trait they are. And we have to work with all those different personality traits. Uh, we do an amazing race. Um, we talk about who we are as a team and what we want to represent. We do a whole exercise one day in kind of the classroom, which is done actually at this retreat. Um, and then we talk a lot about what others would say about us. What is it like to be a Mariner? What, what are other teams saying about us? What, is, you know, what are some what are fans saying when they're watching us play? And we hold ourselves to this. We hold ourselves accountable all throughout the season. And we bring these back up. Week three, we do a, a road trip exhibition. And this is where we put the team cohesion and respect to the test under competition. So lots of games, lots of, you know, hanging out in a hotel room, hanging out in the bus. This is our first experience with actually traveling as a team. And we really start seeing if there's any kind of um, cracks. Uh, week four, league, week four, two league play. Uh, we continue to build team cohesion, goal setting, teamwork, start smaller pod meetings for dinners. If we see our setters and middles aren't working together properly, we send them all off out for lunch, go for lunch, talk it out, because usually there's something off the court that's bugging them. Uh, we also introduce study halls for our team. They all really don't need study halls, but we do it anyways, just so that they actually come together and start working on that team cohesion. 
So that's all preseason. So how to implement some of those key elements, the competitive drive, the common struggle and the fun. Well, the competitive drive in that first week, we do an inner squad game right in front of the first uh, about 140 kids at our camp. We do an inner squad game with tons of stuff that's on the line, whether it's, you know, cooking dinners for the entire retreat, the three days while we're on this retreat, um, whatever it is. But they, they haven't even played together and boom, they got, they're donning a jersey and they're playing in front of the 140 kids and pressure cooker right off the bat in that first week. Uh, they play in that tournament called Volley Bash. It's a big uh, tournament that we host on the island and all the girls, they, they, play, um, they play in this tournament and they got their pride on the line. They're VIU Mariners. They want to look good. They're playing a uh, bunch of beach kids and uh, <laughs> lots of times they're middles and they've never played beach before. So the, the competitive drive is there to actually uh, to look respectable. And then at the retreat, like I said, we do so much at this retreat. One of the things is this amazing race. They spend a whole afternoon racing around the island. There's tug of war competitions. There's raft building. They've got to go out and retrieve uh, things from the lake. There's you name it, we're doing it. Yeah, lip sync contest, everything. We've got a little example of this in a few seconds. Um, fun, how do we implement fun during this, uh, uh, this phase? Uh, everything is a, is fun. The fun component is everywhere. Everything we, we design it, it's natural and calculated throughout this whole uh, preseason phase. Um, the common struggle, the youth camp is a common struggle. These kids, they don't know what it's like to, camp, to be a coach. They have to sit around all day long from nine to four. It's a struggle and we do it together. Um, we also implement like Terry Fox run, CIBC run for the cures. We do a team hike, anything that takes them outside of that uh, comfort level. On our way to our retreat, we do our buying grocery exercise. So we drop them off at the, um, at the grocery store, give them $300, say, okay, you need three dinners, three lunches, three breakfasts. We're an hour and a half away from civilization, go. And they have to figure it out. Um, so those are things that we just constantly uh, grind them a little bit with a common struggle and it seems to work. I just have a quick little video here. Hopefully it works. Uh, this is kind of, it's, I think it's three minutes. So just chill out, watch what we do. This is a day in the life of a mariner. Are you good with that, Jay? Yep, let's go okay. for it. Here we go. Time frame? I'm gonna take my road, make my road. I'm gonna walk on by all night long. I'm looking for a home, for a home. I'm gonna march till down all night long. Walk, 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 walk,
All right, you guys still there, Jay? Yep, we're good. All right, so I just wanted to share, that's kind of a inside of our retreat. That's kind of how our girls roll. And uh, I just wanted you guys to, to day in the life. So I'm gonna rip, rip through this stuff pretty quick. We got about four or five more slides here and then uh, I think it's time for questions. So I'm running a little bit behind, but I'll, I'll get going. So, so that past phase was the preseason phase. Uh, now we're into the competition phase. So during this phase is where you will see any cracks in your cohesion, your respect, and your overall team culture. Once you start competing, that's when it's going to get ugly, if it's going to get ugly. Playing time, team success, stress on and off the court, your academics uh, all start to threaten what you've built. I kind of feel like it's like that uh, Remember the Titans movie where they go off on their retreat and it's all about coming together with their racial struggles and then they get back in their real life and boom, it's that's the real struggle. And that's kind of what it's like here. Uh, once you start playing, once you start competing, that's when you're, you're definitely put to the test. Uh, there are a few things that we do to try and manage the impact. We do team dinners, team activities. We create clear roles for each teammate, a uh, consistent reminder of our vision and our retreat work. And most of all, try to keep a routine. It's like, uh, you know, when you have a baby, a young kid, and you got to keep that routine. If that routine gets off, then obviously you're going to have issues with that, with that child. That's what we do. We try to keep that routine pretty tight during this competition phase. Two biggest things to build and maintain cohesion during this time, especially closer to playoffs, is routine and making every player feel important, even if they're not. Well, even if they feel they're not, uh, every athlete, if they're not, if, if they're 14th to 18th on our team, they're serving a, a purpose for sure they are, but sometimes they forget that they're that important to the team. And so it's really doing team checks, doing individual work with them, uh, meetings with them, and just reminding them how important they are for, for that team. And that will keep your cohesion up. Competition phase. How to implement the key, uh, those key elements, the competitive drive, common struggles, competitive drive drills, drills should be fast paced during our competitive phase in order to keep up this team cohesion and the team culture. This is what I believe. So keep competitive drills going. Um, the players are held accountable for everything during this phase. We try to simulate as much as we can during the week so that players are already um, um, kind of ready for the game time. Lots of six on six drills with revolving lineups so that it doesn't get stale just with the starters. That starting six will start to develop closer to the end of your season. Debrief like crazy after every practice. Say, well, was that good enough, ladies? Was that, come on, we can do better. Or yeah, that was great, but debrief. Um, the wins and the losses in both practice and games are key. You've got to create that competitive drive. Now we're not doing that every practice. Uh, we're obviously doing some technical work and stuff, but our usually every Thursday practice is a com there's competitive drive in our Thursday practice. A common struggle. What where is our common struggle in this? Well, we use a we use a um, a loss or a bad performance to break it down. We use drills in our practice like Phantom. I'm sure you guys all have names for this, but it's where six on zero. And at our level, it has to be a, a, a really aggressive uh, um, attack. And uh, if it touches the net, doesn't count. If it's a roll shot, doesn't count. Even though it may score against an opponent, but we're looking for an elite kind of execution. 
and uh, and lots of times we'll start at 18 all. And if if we mess up, if we shank a pass or we miss a serve, then Phantom gets a point. So we're playing a team that doesn't exist. And so we're putting that common struggle on there. Most times your team will never win. And so then you give that opportunity to the athletes to come back the following practice and try and beat them. And the more times that they're successful, the more they're rallying together to be part of that team. And that culture really starts developing. Um, fun, the bigger the match, the lighter you get or we get. This is, this is new for us. Let's make that very clear. So in the last five years, the bigger the match, the more we, we take it light, lighter. Um, the lesser the match, the heavier we get. So we put pressure on them, even though that that team, we know we're going to beat three straight and probably not even break a sweat, but we're going we're gonna to make it sound like it's a national final and we're going to do the reverse when it is the national final. The team plays harder for each, each other, the more comfortable they are with each other and the more fun they are having together is what gets them through, uh, gets them more comfortable playing together. So that's our competition phase. It's, it's pretty crazy um, uh, how it's evolved. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've created in this uh, fun factor is we've created, I think it was four years ago at our, uh, when we, we or sorry, three years ago when we won our first national championship in this, in this stretch, uh, everybody was stressed out at our servant pass. So we created a um, um, fun police. One of the, the girls that everybody kind of revolved around, she was our star player, but sometimes she just didn't get motivated. I called her over and said, hey, you're going to be the sheriff of this fun police. And then I brought in a first year athlete and said, OK, you're going to be your deputy. And if you see anybody looking way too serious, you get in there and you go crazy on them. So this is our servant pass before our national championship. And these guys are like uh, going crazy on them, making them do the worm. And, and, and it worked. It was a total shot in the dark. I never had any. I didn't think it would ever work. And I was really desperate. And so to this day, we have our fun police. Also, another story here is we're uh, in our national final and uh, attached. We're in Grand Prairie. We couldn't do anything cool um, outside. Usually we break down video. We get all serious in the morning. Then we try to escape and have fun during the afternoon. And then boom, it's business time right before our championship. And so I rented out all of these, um, these stuffed animals that you ride. I phoned them up and said, how much is it to rent all of these? It was something like 80 bucks. I said, I got a university team coming in there. Can adults ride them? And they said, yeah, yeah, no problem. So we created four teams of four and we had a little mini um, amazing race in the mall riding these, uh, these stuffed animals. This was our national, actually, sorry, this was our semifinal at nationals. That's what we do. So this is that tough, crazy, you know, kick their butt in practice, kick their butt in games, debrief it, and then have some fun when it's, when it's a, a time to, to really be stressed out. So that's an example of the competition phase and the fun. Postseason phase, this is a very important phase for your team uh, to seal their culture. It is, it is very, very um, important. Regardless of how your team did on the court, um, you need to celebrate the season with a windup. Have a team dinner, a camping trip, a fun day doing something, no matter how much you want to move on and make the effort to close the season off. Sometimes as a coach, we just want to get it done and get back with our families, but it's important to seal it off and have that, uh, have that closure to your season. Have exit meetings individually with your athletes. Tell the athlete the truth. This is something that is tough to do. And sometimes I get criticized for, for being who I am because I do do this. And I think later on, these athletes respect it. But explain to them what they did well and what they need improving on. Uh, if they are returning, make it clear where they stand in the lineup and give them hope. Um, if there is no hope, then you need to let them, let them know that. You can't give them false hope. Uh, it is a tough thing to tell them, but giving them false hope will only cause cracks to the following year's culture. Um, and last thing, make it clear to every athlete that you are there for them after the season is done, even if that means after they are done playing for you. This goes a long way in creating team culture. There's lots of times where I'll tell people, hey, I'm, I, I may be super competitive and, 
maybe come across as a jerk on the court, but I think any athlete that's ever played for me will say that I've got their back at all times, well after their playing career. And that's how we've, we've really created that team culture. Competition phase, how to implement the key struggles of the competitive drive, common struggle and the fun. Competitive drive, as mentioned earlier, tell them the truth, where they stand in their exit meetings. This, will mo this motivation will be better. Uh, this will get them fighting for a starting spot, battling for an all Canadian, maybe making the national team. A common struggle, reflect on your season during your wind up, get the team to remember the hard times at the start and bring them together, uh, how the season went and, and just kind of reflect on that whole season. Um, one example for us is we, this, this season, every single time we went to compete on the mainland, there, there was a windstorm. So we would miss that ferry. Sometimes we would play at eight o'clock. Sometimes we'd have to replay our match. It just seemed like every single time we were playing, there was some kind of a struggle. So we reflected on that. And then um, one time our, our bus uh, caught on fire on the way to our ferry. So we laughed it off and jumped on the side of the road and started playing that block rocker. Anything that had fire in the song, we thought it was funny and they, they danced away to it. When we got to nationals this year, it was like, okay, we've had everything thrown at us. And literally we showed up on Monday in Quebec City for our national championships. By Wednesday, the world had flipped over and everything was in chaos. Everything was being shut down. Major League Baseball, Major League uh, Hockey, Basketball, everything. Our youth sports uh, championships were shut down and we we're in the mix of this. And so I just said to the girls, hey, whatever is thrown at us, this is the biggest thing being thrown at us. And we kind of, not that we should laugh anything off in terms of COVID, but we, um, we laughed it off and said, okay, bring it on. This is the biggest thing thrown at us. And we won the championship. But afterwards, we laughed at this. We had a Zoom meeting and we said, look at the struggles that we had all season. And this was our, uh, we, we reflected on our common struggle. And fun, let loose, have some fun. All season you've lived in a pressure cooker. So find a way to have fun at whatever level you are at. Play some paintball, go uh, do a karaoke night as we did this year because we, we had to, we had a Zoom celebration and it actually was a lot of fun. We played some games on Zoom. The outcome of great team culture is program tradition. So our team has traditions galore. After years of successful team culture, tradition is created, which leads to successful program culture. And that means a lot. You can have a great team one year, but if, if you, know, you fluke out, maybe you don't do much for your team culture, but if you wanna have a team, sorry, a program culture, you need to really, really work at this, uh, this cohesion, respect and overall team culture. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to adjust it or improve on it. If we think it's perfect um, how it is, then it will quickly be obsolete. So we don't need to reinvent it, but we always gotta add to it and start changing. As I spoke to it earlier, about five, six years ago, I've really implemented this fun factor and, and that was never there in my previous seasons and boom, we're winning now. So uh, something must have worked. And last but not least, just ended off with our slide. And I believe this, this uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And that's, uh, that's all I got guys. I'm open for questions. Four minutes hey, late. Shane. Thanks, Shane. If uh, you want to just uh, ex exit your screen share, sure. And we'll we'll begin the Q and A period. Uh, we got a, a good amount of questions already, and I think we'll continue to to uh, answer questions for for the next little bit. We are kind of at that hour mark already, but uh, I think if people are, are willing to stay on, and uh, you're you're willing to answer some questions here, we'll we'll just uh, keep at her. So, yeah, really liked the presentation, really liked uh, hearing a little bit more about some specifics about how you've gone about creating that culture with your program and, and really like the framework with the, how you implement it with your seasonal plan and the clear examples. Now, most of the people who, who are on the call are, are at the high school context or they're at a club level. And I think one thing that maybe differs from the that context of the post-secondary is just a condensed season. So what were, what would be the, the two or three takeaways that you would 
from your context, the, the college level, and how would you how would you apply them in that shorter season? Uh, what would there be anything different you would do, or or anything you would emphasize a bit differently? No, obviously, I, I probably you don't have time to have four phases. Uh, your first phase is kind of gone, and uh, and everything has shrunk down a little bit. But definitely, in terms of uh, those challenges, the you know competitive drive and creating that common struggle. Hey, why not? Um, and, and creating that fun, I would have that. And, and I definitely would spend the time in the first, uh, first session to, um, first, sorry, first phase is to create that cohesion. You got to build that team, that teamness. I was doing those same things when I was coaching senior boys volleyball, and I was doing the same things when I was coaching juvenile girls. It, uh, we were doing hikes, we were doing all of that. Um, and I think it, it, to this day, has brought a lot of those kids still close to me, even from that club club uh, level. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now imagine you're the club director, club coach of a, of a new club team. What would be the first place you would start in terms of developing uh, a culture for, for that club? And, and how would you really instill uh, a winning culture and expectation of, of excellence when that hasn't happened yet? Or again, you're just a new developing club. Well, it's like I tell our athletes, I want everybody, we've, we've done exercises where they have to write what it's like to be an A person or an A uh, uh, student athlete. And the answer isn't always to get an A. If you're getting a C plus, that's your A. And and I think that that's what you have to, you have to be realistic in starting a club. Are you going to be amazing in your first season? Absolutely not. You might be, but the, you got to start with some goals and you've got to have uh, reachable goals, the whole SMART process. You actually really have to start, uh, you know, having some, some challenging goals, but definitely achievable goals. But I would, I would still frame it the same way, just knowing that you may not be winning that championship. You may be winning a tier three championship, but that sure feels like it was a tier one championship. So I, I really wouldn't change too much. I would still keep those same, that same process there, uh, but just realize that your expectations may not be as high as maybe somebody that's been more developed. Okay, awesome. Uh, you know, one item we're getting a, a lot of questions on is this like concept of fun that you've alluded to quite a few times. And can you maybe explain to us how that uh, has evolved or how your philosophy on developing culture has evolved to a point where now fun is front and center? I mean, you know, you're, you guys are renting, you know, furry animals and going and taking them for a ride in a mall before a national semifinal. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's fun. Um, so how is, you know, is there maybe an example of what, what changed your mindset there? and why you started to incorporate that? The only thing that kind of jumps out at me is, is a, a season where we're underachieving. And it actually was that furry animal season where um, we were playing our nemesis from, from uh, BC and Douglas College. And we couldn't, we couldn't beat them. We had a team that was comparable, but we, every time we played them, we just could not, we had that mental block against them. They were our kryptonite. And we couldn't get past that. And, and if we continued on that same, we got to be, you know, breakdown video. We got to work on our the blocking, this, that, this. And we did that. We changed a lot of technical stuff too. But something just wasn't there. And we needed to spark something. And that was where I, it, to be honest with you, with this whole fun process, I really, we were at a, we were at an, at an area, a level that we were not going to succeed any longer doing the same thing we could not keep that same thing happening and so it was out of a little bit of desperation where i threw it a little bit to the to the vets and the team and it could have crashed and burned we would look like fools and even to this day we look like fools in a lot of the things we do but the girls it's just taking away that pressure and when you are on in our program i showed you guys the success that our program has everybody wants us to lose we have targets on our back 24 seven. So we walk around with so much stress. If we have a, if we lose two matches in a season, the newspapers are reporting about how bad we are. 
and that's so unrealistic. But so something needed to change in our program, and it was creating more fun. And uh, you know, there's days where seriously, I, I go in there and I'm like, come on, guys, that's too far. You've taken this too far. This year, we we uh, were at nationals in in uh, Quebec City, and the girls were doing an air bend before our semifinal, and they busted the uh, the the bench because they were all on top of it and you know jamming away. And so I had to go there, athletic director, say, hey, you shut this down. Like, um, and sorry, we'll pay for anything. But, but uh, so yeah, it, it's one of those things. I think it, it kind of came out of desperation a little bit, but it also came out of just feeling the stress for so long that we needed to do something different. Awesome. You know, a big part of any team is, is the captains or the leadership group within, within that team. Uh, how do you go about picking captains or, or assembling that leadership group and, and what are some specific qualities that you look for? Uh, that's a tough question because it changes every year. Um, I think we groom them a little bit, to be honest with you. We have the, again, this is the difference between a, you know, a high school uh, team or a club team where you only have them for a couple months but we groom them from day one when they're in their first season and they're staying with us hopefully for five years. So we're able to see the, the progression of their, of their um, leadership. Uh, so most times I actually, I went down the route of uh, uh, the road of having the players select, but it's a, it can crash and burn. You can have the nicest or the funnest person be that captain. And they really aren't the, aren't the one that you want to, give the reins to. Um, so I select the captains, but it doesn't matter if they're a fifth year athlete or a second year athlete, if they've got those right attributes, then, then they're, they're rolling with it, but they definitely need to have the ear of the team. And you can sense that when you have the finger of the pulse on your team, you can kind of sit back and say, yeah, this, this person's the one that's going to take over next year. So we had two amazing um, captains that have just finished their program. They finished their five years. And we've been grooming two other um, third-year athletes well, going into their fourth years that will now be our captains. But we have fifth-year athletes, but they're jumping over those fifth-year athletes. So we've, we've been targeting these two since they were in their second year because they have those leadership qualities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered that. No, no, no. That's great. That's, uh, that's awesome. Thanks. Now, in terms of connecting with the athletes and, and just understanding how their experience is going, whether it's positive or negative. Can you just talk us through some strategies you, you use to, uh, to connect with athletes uh, with, you know, communication throughout the year um, to just really gauge the temperature of, of how your culture is doing and, and maybe speak to any kind of indicators you have or anything specifically that you can tangibly see or feel with, with the culture. That's a good point. And at every level, uh, you know, you talk about the high school level or the club level, I think it's important that you're constantly connecting. The first line I use is I, I connect with my, my, um, my captains and my veterans. And I kind of just do a little bit of a uh, little, little quick checks. Hey, how's everyone doing? Are you notice anyone struggling? And that's not always going to pick up uh, your problems. But you're gonna you're gonna get the low hanging fruit right away by just talking to them. They're gonna say, "Oh, so and so is really struggling this week. Something's up with them. You should talk with them." Okay, boom, into my office. We're having a chat. Um, from that point on, uh, we do checks in our first semester. We do a lot of checks with first year athletes because those are the ones that are gonna struggle in that first semester because they're leaving home. They're 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 totally in a different environment. So we do a lot of uh, checks with them. We've actually used our assistant coaches to do these smart start, start smart uh, program. So they'll have little pods of four and they'll just um, call them in and check with them and see how they're doing. Um, but it's a lot of that. It's a lot of connecting with them um, and, uh, and just reviewing at times. You usually can, can see on the court if somebody is just off, then it's like, Hey, can you come see me tomorrow? And, you know, maybe it's just, if it's something serious, it's we're, we're meeting off campus and we're having a coffee or maybe it's issues with with players. And I alluded to it where maybe a setter in the middle, they're not connecting and there's attitude. And it's like, hey, you guys are going to have lunch together. So a lot of those types of things. But there also comes a time where, you know, you've done all your due diligence to get that player to your program. 
and a month in, you know, as a coach that that player is not connecting to your program. You know that that they're not going to be along. Uh, they're not going to buy into the culture. And so it's one of those things where it's like, I hate to say it, you do everything you can in that first semester, but you realize, yeah, this, this kid is not going to be able to, to fit with us and no hard feelings or anything. But by the end of that season, you help them find a new home somewhere else and uh, you do everything you can for them, but definitely lots of check-ins. Awesome. Now, maybe it's not a major difference between your program and clubs and high schools, but one kind of factor uh, with, with the athletes experience in, in playing volleyball is, is how their parents are involved, right? And, and how they are involved with, with the club. And so, is that something that you take into consideration when you're looking at building the team culture, building respect with athletes? Um, and, and are there some kind of parental involvement with your context? And um, how would you address that at the club or high school level uh, of having parents involved with building your team culture? That is an amazing question. And when I started uh, my coaching career, I coached at that level. And that was one thing uh, that was not as much of an issue then as it is now. And I see it with our program now, the amount of par uh, parent influence is crazy. Even with our program, the amount of times that we have to go out of our way to have a team dinner at one of our, our athletes' parents' place, the, the girls love it, but for me as a coach, it totally works against my, my preparation stages and, and, and we have to do it basically because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm losing the team if, if, if I don't uh, agree to it. Um, but the parents are so influenced, even at the university college level, it is, it is crazy. So down at the high school, at the club levels, you can't escape it because the the co the parents are the ones driving the athletes to the practices to the games paying for most of this stuff so definitely you have to keep the parents involved the only thing that i would suggest is that um limit it as much as you can um i think there's a time and a place for parents to be involved and there's a time and a place for the team to gel together so uh, I remember I went back a bunch of years back and one of the clubs didn't have um, a, a coach. So my coaching staff went back and coached this club and uh, juvenile club, um, U18 club. And I couldn't believe it. I was in a timeout. One of the parents came down with like four granola bars and they're like giving it to their daughter and saying, here, you need to eat some food. And I turned around and I looked at this parent and I almost lost it on her. That is my time as a coach and her time as a player to, to, to be together, not a parent. And so we developed kind of parenting rules for that club. Hey, we'd love to have you guys there, but during this time, this time, this time, this time, parents aren't allowed. And there's no disrespect, but it's our time to create that culture. One of the things, unfortunately, back in the day was 15 passenger vans was the greatest thing in the world uh, when now it's tough to get a 15 passenger van because of safety. But back in the day, it was like, hey, I want all the team traveling with me, not with their parents, because that is a time where a lot of that culture is built is on road trips. Um, and, and that's some stuff that as as a coach coaching at that level, I strongly would suggest that you have meetings with your parents. You develop some times that that's their time. And definitely these are the times where our athletes uh, are together. We don't, when we're on road trips, um, they stay with our, with our teams, um, not with their parents. It's uh, it's, it's our time for sure. Awesome. Um, so one phase you, you talked quite a bit about was that preseason phase. And it seems like there's quite a bit of work that you put into um, I mean, really starting with recruitment and putting together your team um, from that standpoint, leading up to prior to competition with the retreat you mentioned, uh, preseason exhibition. Um, club programs, high schools maybe don't have that same opportunity. They, you know, there's not um, 
you know, the, the ability to recruit specific athletes and uh, the amount of time we have in the preseason is, is definitely different. So how would you maybe apply some of your concepts to that preseason phase or what are some considerations you would have for the club coach in that, you know, very important preseason part? So yeah, definitely you cannot recruit, uh, even though I think it sort of happens on the mainland now um, or and all over the place, I guess, but definitely you sh there's no recruiting at that level. But when you talk about that preseason uh, preparation phase for culture and then talk about the retreat and all that, how you don't have enough time in your club season, that was the same argument that I had with myself and people had with what I was doing back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where it was like, you should be in exhibition tournaments. You got to play, 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 play. And it's like, yeah, I do. I got to practice too. But in my mind, this stuff was more important than the X's and O's. The team culture was first. That was no doubt about it. And I was doing this when I was coaching at that level, the, the, the team retreats and that team building, that cohesion uh, exercises. I, I basically substituted that for some of the preseason um, tournaments. Mm -hmm. And I still do. You talk to my basketball coaches and, in, uh, uh, on our, at our university, and I had to do a presentation. My athletic director made to do a presentation on fun and bringing a team together. And I was like, really? They don't like me enough because we're winning and they're not. And, uh, and I had to do this presentation on, to the men's basketball program. And they're like, could never happen with us because we need to, we need to uh, compete. And that is always the argument. But I believe that you substitute the, uh, the competition for the team building. Awesome. And I'll stand by that to the end, for sure. Great. Okay, just a couple more here, Shane. Um, so in your season, competitive drive, huge part of your training environment. Um, how do you go about rewarding that competitive drive or, or maybe, you know, penalizing it within, within your practice, you know, you know, winners um, don't have to take down the net as an example or, or something else uh, along those lines. How, how does that come about in your practice environment? Yeah, well, we have, uh, we have player of the practice, uh, you know, every year it changes a little bit. Um, one year we had a onesie that they would wear and that was their, the player of the practice won that. Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't be just given to the person that hadn't won it in a while, we would give it to the person that actually deserved it, whether that was a starter or a bench player. Um, so we would do player of the practices. Uh, we, <laughs> the amount of betting and gambling that we do in a game, in a practice is absurd. Uh, it, fun stuff, but definitely it's like, okay, next road trip, this is who's, um, um, you know, cooking dinner. This is who's doing this, that, whatever. So there's always something on the line. Um, you know, if you would ask me this 15 years ago, old school, it was a lot of negative reinforcement. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't negative reinforcement in our practices at times, but you got to really mess up for us to pull out negative reinforcement nowadays. Um, it, it is more, more based on the, uh, the positive reinforcement, but because I still hold a little bit of this, um, reputation, I can still pretend I'm going to go there. Um, so uh, that, that helps me a little bit, but, um, but definitely it's more positive stuff and, and it's a lot on the line. If you want to see a team really compete hard, especially a university team, uh, every year, our first years are the rookies. They get rookie duties. They got to fill water bottles, carry around the equipment. And I guess that's our sign, our, our one phase of um, hazing. But if we play and there's six on six competition and the losers have to be the rookies for the weekend, wow, you can see the competitiveness uh, spark up in a hurry. Great. Um, you know, besides fun, what do you feel like has changed the most in the last 20 years with how you approach building and implementing your culture? Oh, that's a tough question. It's changed so much. Um, I think for me as a coach, is that where you're going with me as a coach or the program? Yeah. 
you, also, you as a coach and, and how yeah. you've implemented culture. Well, for, for me as a coach, I think the biggest thing is that when I started, started coaching, I was like 24 years old. So I wasn't that far off the same age as, as some of my athletes. And so um, I had to be a bit more of a jerk to, to show that I was actually um, in charge. Um, the, the more I've matured, we'll call it, um, the more comfortable I am at delegating to my assistant coaches, that's 100%. And the more that I'm just comfortable in, in terms of, of making a change, like we talked about, about changing to this fun factor, you know, it's like, why not? It's not the end of the world if we, if we try this. Um, so I, I really think that with maturing uh, as a coach, it's allowed me to just to be a little calmer. I, you know, if, we, if we're not a 10 out of 10 at one practice, who cares? We'll get them the next practice. Whereas when I started my coaching career, it was like, we got to be the best all the time, everywhere. This is ridiculous. Like, and I think that we've lightened up a little bit. And, and for me as a, as a coach, I, I really do value the, the, um, the athletes. I value who they are. And I think that mutual respect is so, so much greater now than it was uh, 20 years ago. So, yeah. Awesome. Kids help with that too. Yeah. It's two kids. You, 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 that's my escape now is going to practice. Yeah. I uh, can only <laughs> imagine. Um, I guess lastly, how, how do you balance the, you know, the pressure and the expectation of, of having this winning culture and, and continuing to, to have that success um, in, in your life as a coach? So um, how, how do you go about trying to find balance or, or maybe there isn't balance, but how, how would you balance that? When I leave the court, I leave the court, uh, and I have my life outside of volleyball. I don't coach provincial team anymore. I don't do anything summer related. I do have beach volleyball stuff that I do on my end, but definitely when I leave the, leave the court, uh, unless it's an emergency, um, no one contacts me on a Sunday. Like Sunday is my day. Uh, you can find me 24 seven Monday, Monday to Friday. If it's an emergency, but definitely I found time to, to walk away and, and really leave the uh, stress of volleyball um, at the, uh, at the IU. Um, before I would come home and I would be upset with, the way I practice went and I would take it out on my kids and my wife and, and, and then the next day I'd still be cranky with how we performed and I couldn't let it go. Now I literally, it's, it's like, okay, it's over. It's volleyball. It's not the biggest thing in the world. And I try to tell that to new coaches, uh, coaches that, that all they think about you, you have a discussion with a new coach instead of having a, having a social time with, with somebody, all they can do is talk volleyball for me, it's like, I, that's the last thing I want to talk about when I'm outside of the, uh, uh, the gym. I, I, I want to have a life. And I, I don't think I had a life in my first 10 years. And to, to be honest with you, I'm enjoying coaching volleyball about, I think it was about seven years ago. I was like, yeah, this is my last year. This is my last year. I don't even, I don't even say that anymore. I'm having the most fun coaching right now. I've got a great group of kids. We've got this mutual respect that we're, we're rolling with. And like you said, I've got this balance between um, coaching and, and real life. So um, yeah, I, I don't see myself hanging them up for a little while anyways. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, I think that's it for, for now. I uh, really appreciate the time you took today, Shane, to, to take us through that presentation and, and answer questions. And yeah. Um, yeah, for, for all those who've attended, thanks for, for listening in. We have our next presentation tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m. with Charles Parkinson, and he's going to be taking us through his planning process. So really looking forward to that. Um, till then, have a good one, and uh, thanks again, Shane. No problem. Thank you, Jay. And one other thing I'd just like to say, if there's anybody out there, if they want to reach out to, to myself about anything, feel free. Just uh, shoot me an email through VIU. Uh, Mariners. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Jay.